All right, let's try this again. I thought I was recording a moment ago. I started talking and then the camera cut off, so clearly I wasn't recording. It's okay, I wasn't too far into this. I literally just recorded, I, I'm, I just got out of a traffic jam 10 minutes ago, recorded the video called Big Dogs Down that's over on the other channel. Literally just recorded it and uploaded it as I'm driving. You know, horrible, horrible. Don't copy me, don't do what I do, but felt like it was kind of urgent. <laughs> It was in a traffic jam, so it was easier to do everything. You know, I know there's cars all around me. We're going five miles an hour, so I did the recording and the uploading and the copying and pasting of the stuff in the description, all of that. I'm glad I figured out how to do all this on my phone so it's easier for me and you all get more content spontaneously spur of the moment. Okay, so in that traffic jam, before that traffic jam, Am I recording? My phone says, check your charger connection. Still recording. Good. Sorry about that. Um, that's going to send me off the road. I hope you can hear me over the noise of the, tra of the travel car, the road. I rented a tiny little economy car for this road trip. So it's not very I, uh, quiet in here. Uh, sorry. You should all be used to my squirrel. You should be used to that by now. <laughs> so as I was driving, I just listened to about an hour long uh, YouTube video. Thank God for YouTube. All of my favorite theologians I can find on YouTube. So I was just listening to one of my favorite theologians. I'll talk about him in a minute. But one of my other favorite theologians, I remember him saying... It's a rough paraphrase. It was a while ago. He was talking about Christian culture. Now, the American, he was specifically talking about American Christian culture, I believe. And American Christian culture is actually a subculture of the culture at large, even though the United States was a Christian culture when it was founded. And would, in, us, in one sense of the word, is still a Christian culture. But that's the word Christian has developed different meanings uh, other than its original intent as coined in Antioch, you know, when they were first called Christians in the book of Acts. It was in Antioch that they were first called Christians. Well, that meant something very specific, and it, as time goes on, words develop new meanings. So there's 2.4 billion Christians on the planet today, which just means people that would identify with Christian, the term and terminology uh, in one way or another. I was born in a Christian nation, or I was christened as a baby in the church of such and such. So the meaning of the word Christian, I, you know, doesn't mean that if all 2.4 billion of those people die today, that they have a saving knowledge or believe that Jesus rose from the dead and confess that with their mouths, okay? But, so the Christian church that this theologian is talking about Christendom and he's referring to sincere believers uh, the, the Romans 10, 9 and 10 believers it's, it's a subculture of America and a subculture of Christendom overall and so what he was saying is stay with me I'm here drop the phone just barely got this thing propped up here I don't want to hit stop record, but I want you to be able to see me when I talk. Um, so he said, it's going to fall again, I know, it's going to fall again. Part of the dysfunction of a Christian culture is, for example, well, I mean, you can be isolated from non-Christians in Christian culture. You can just go to church you can just hang out at youth group. You can just hang out with your Christian friends. And the only interaction you have with non-Christians might be at the grocery store, the checkout lady, or something like that. Um, but but one of the uh, one of the dysfunctions is is we we tend to idolize Christian celebrities. Like I've got you know name your top five. Christian artists 
right? Musicians. Like, oh, this so-and-so, this singer, or this band, and you know, or your top five Christian evangelists, televangelists, etc. But how many of you can list your top five Christian intellectuals or theologians? And when he said that, I'm like, yeah, I mean, I became a Christian at 18 and was immersed in Christian culture. And I can list a bunch of artists that were my favorites and speakers that were my favorites. But thank God, in my bent, the way I'm created, I pursued the intellectual. Like, I can list my top five Christian intellectuals. It's interesting, and I'll list them for you. Well, I can list top four. Number five is going to be... I'll just pick a, pick a name out of a hat because there's so many, but I can list my top four Christian intellectuals. And one of them I was just listening to. But what's interesting is that all four of the top, my top four, they're, they all begin with two, in, two letter initials and then their last name. Every one of them. And here they are in no particular order. C.S. Lewis. Uh, J.P. Moreland. N.T. Wright R.C. Sproul It's like J.P. N.T. C.S. R.C. Uh, so any of those guys well three of them are on YouTube J.P. N.T. and R.C. find a bunch of their stuff on YouTube thank God for YouTube so I can listen and be strengthened in my faith C.S. There's some C.S. Lewis reading, somebody reading his stuff on YouTube, so you can find him. Who would I put as my fifth favorite Christian intellectual? Hmm. If I, if I, if I mean who has impacted me theologically, personally, I might say Hugh Ross. Hopefully, I mean, okay. Uh, that's like I said, Christendom is dysfunctional right now. There's a lot of fighting and infighting, and what? That guy's a heretic. Uh, so I, I hesitate to even go there, but let's just not go there. But I, in listening to, I was just listening to N.T. Wright, the guy's the most incredible New Testament theologian. The guy just has so much, just, he opens his mouth and just truth, truth from a depth of knowledge and understanding just come just rushing out. You know, see, I told you it would fall again. Here, I'm going to unplug the charger. That might help. Don't stop recording. Ah, bumpy road. What was I going to say? Something I was thinking about uh, when I was listening to N.T. Wright. And, and he said something. One of those common phrases that we recognize, that we automatic, automatically recognize as truth. And there's the one that he mentioned is one that I actually believe is patently false but we all say it and just think of course that's true but I believe the expression is patently false it's partially true but in its ultimate meaning it is patently false though we all admit it as true I'll explain that in a second why I believe it's false but I thought of a couple others a couple other of those expressions that we use that we think is true think are true that are kind of false. For example, history repeats itself. History repeats. Okay. By definition, history can't repeat. You like, can't go get back in time and have the exact same things happen. So the more appropriate phrase is history rhymes. That's not original. Uh, 
that somebody else came up with that history does not repeat, but it rhymes. In other words, there are types of things that happen that recur over and over again. Yes, things happen in patterns and cycles. So, so to say history repeats isn't false. The, the spirit of the concept is true, right? Spirit. Obviously, we don't mean that history can possibly repeat. It's an impossibility for history to repeat. But what is encapsulated in the concept is history rhymes. Yes, so we, so it's not wrong to say history repeats. But if you're being literalistic, it does, can't possibly repeat. And then the other related expression that we use is those who don't learn history are doomed to repeat it. Uh, that one is quote-unquote false for the same reason because history can't possibly repeat, but that one is a true one. Now, the one that N.T. Wright mentioned, and we all are guilty of this, when we hear something that sounds true, and I'm not blaming N.T. Wright for saying something false, I'm just saying some expressions become so a part of our linguistic domain. All right, Each one of us has a domain, a semantic domain. We all have a vocabulary, a limited vocabulary. In some people's vocabulary, some people's linguistic domain or semantic domain is much larger than others. Um, but we all have a, you know, a, a, a range of terms with which we comfortably and freely communicate our understanding of reality. And so we it's full of metaphors, it's full of similes, it's full of uh, uh, hyperbolic expression. Uh, and so there are these concise, condensed little packages that convey a lot of meaning. And how uh, so this expression that he used, power corrupts, and absolute power corrupts absolutely. I don't, that may not be exactly how it's phrased, but that's how I remember it. Power corrupts, but absolute power corrupts absolutely. This is patently false. And then maybe it's false in the same way that history repeating is not false, is, is, is not true or is false. And comment in the comment section your insights into this. But the reason, okay, that this is patently false, power tends to corrupt, I think so. Power tends to corrupt and absolute power corrupts absolutely. Here's the, here's the problem. God is not corrupt, and he's the only one with absolute power. Period. No human, outside of Jesus Christ, has absolute power. And Jesus Christ is sinless. So absolute power does not corrupt absolutely. I understand the intent. It, it, from a, an atheistic point of view, it's true. Right? From as an atheist, a person who does not believe in the existence of God, an atheist, to an atheist, the, the greatest power is the state, right? An individual can have power. A corporate body has greater power. And so the state is God. And that explains a lot of what's going, in our, going on in our culture right now, that the rejection of God means the state has the most power. And so whoever's in charge of the state is God, has the power of God. If there is no God, then the state is God. And so that is the meaning of absolute power there. Whoever is the, the dictator the, is the one who has absolute power. And in a godless worldview, yes, absolute power being that of the dictator, the totalitarian corrupts absolutely. But that's not reality. It's only a term you can use if you don't believe in God. 
<laughs> I guess. I mean, it only it's only true for atheists or or non-theists or or get it. You know what I'm saying? You know, absolute power is pure good, truth, justice, and some of the philosophers of old, of some of the greats of boil down that actually the best form of government is a monarchy. A monarchy. A benevolent monarchy, but a monarchy. Because in such a system, uh, everyone knows who's in charge. Everyone knows who to cater to. You just hope that boss, whoever that is, is good. Um, and so... Alright. There. There's my, my ramble for the for the time being. Comment in the comment section. Uh, this is the kind of stuff I like to, ch to, to meditate on. Speculate on. Alright, bye.